What would happen if Ted Wolsey was still translating all of Square Enix's catalog? We talk about ROM hacking, artistic license, and whether or not you can even have a perfect translation on this episode of the GHG Show. Hi everyone, welcome to the Glasshouse Game Show, recorded in London, not at Brick Lane, but remotely. Uh, I am Alex, joined today by Shay and other Alex. Alex P, hello. hello there. Hi. And today we are joined to talk about one of my favorite topics, which is language and translation in games. Uh, I think this partially came off of the back of our recent uh, adventure with Yakuza, Like a Dragon, one of the finest games on this <laughs> side of Y2K. And uh, yeah, we were thinking a lot about just that game that it's got so much personality and so much silliness and uh, flair. And it's a series that uh, wasn't always uh, in English for a long time that now ha has been translated, most of them, or, or if not all of them, that we were just thinking about this and we thought, let let's have a little episode talking about those things. But first, before we get started, I want to talk to y'all about your experience first with other languages just in general in your life, whether you grew up speaking other ones or you've ever tried your hand at, at learning any, and then maybe a little bit about your experience with games as well, if you've ever if you've ever dabbled. Um, with and, translating games? Not at translating games. <laughs> We're not getting to that point yet. With just trying games in different languages and seeing how that sure. feels. But yeah, so what, what did you all... I think I'm an open book here because I always talk about I grew up speaking Spanish. I'm half Spanish. So that's always been there for me um I, and that wasn't accessible to me in terms of playing games until i was a little bit older uh even with like the rom hack community and stuff but there and then there was japanese as well a little bit of japanese i studied but i want to hear from y'all let's go come on folks hit me with something weird you're going to be like i studied you know <laughs> esperanto and actually <laughs> well you know my family is chinese so i studied a bit i studied a bit of Mandarin and then a lot of Cantonese and um, I'm conversational with Cantonese. Uh, I've studied a bit of French as well when I lived there for a little while, um, like less than a year, okay. but a little while. And uh, I've com I don't wanna, I don't want to say completely lost it, <laughs> but there's something about being in the active. Yeah. Like having to use the language yeah. and being in the active use of it. Um, and then I when I moved to London, I, I tried to keep lessons up, but at the time, I was taking, I was going to school for just other stuff. Mm. And then I was also taking, taking French lessons, Mandarin lessons, and Cantonese, les Cantonese lessons. And it was just, I had to drop, <laughs> I had to drop one <laughs> of them. Too much French languages. Was, uh, French French. Was, uh, was the thing that got dropped. And I just, because I don't have any, mm -hmm. I don't have any French friends or any ways to use it unless I was just nonstop watching French films or something. <laughs> <laughs> I lost that. But uh, yeah, I mean, I've, I've, just by nature of necessity kept up Cantonese I eventually Mandarin dropped away as well mm -hmm. but um there's not a whole lot of game options mm. in for like not just to play in Cantonese um but games that it would make sense to play in Cantonese mm -hmm. uh there's one which maybe you'll bring up later but Sleeping Dogs okay. uh which is a really bad example <laughs> I think like it's one of the the bad things that we'll talk about maybe in this yeah. episode um uh but because yeah mostly you know if you're having a game in another language it'll be in you might have the option for just the text or like the game menus and everything like that where games aren't typically in won't necessarily be voiced in in even if it is voiced in chinese it won't be cantonese yeah and then i also don't i can't read um i can't read can't chinese read period can't read i can't read chinese i can only speak interesting um, interesting that's a difficult one as well because with with specifically with chinese and japanese with languages that rely so heavily on like hanzi kanji it's yeah it's a, it's a huge barrier to entry um yeah well i mean even more so like with at least with my understanding with korean and japanese there's they have i know there's all of the the characters and stuff yeah. that is based on memorization but there's still a base language that you can sort of read yeah, but I mean, it's Chinese, tough. It's tough no with Japanese reading. because it it really is unintelligible without kanji. Like, you, but but mm. there is there's a lot of intermediate letters and other alphabets and ways that you can read maybe things. Something and, together. It, you can string the context together, it, right? Sort of. Like, I mean, and it, you don't maybe don't know the the nouns or something yeah. like that. But with Chinese, it's 
100% memorization, including just the yeah. to the A. Home. Well, and I also think this is something we'll get into is that the, the difference with Japanese is that um, it just just because of like world history, it is it is, you know, intimately linked up with like the world economy and it's a modern, yeah. very advanced industrial nation. So like there's just way more materials that the, the Internet is obsessed with learning Japanese. So like you can find <laughs> a million different classes and thing. And we're going to get into some of the materials in a, Thanks, in a bit. Anime. Um, and, <laughs> and it's, you know, the, the penetration of even just like games themselves into China, although they've always been played there. It's just yeah. as an industry, it's even, you know, it, it, from like, you remember the IQ, you know, it was like the, the way of like bringing the GameCube N64 stuff over there. Like it's, it's been a while. So I can, I can see why that would be, but I have hopes and dreams regarding that. Shay, you got any, you got anything for me? Before I, I do, before I get into that though, I just want to ask, do they not make you lot study languages in American school? They do. Oh yeah. Guess what I, I mean, took? You take... <laughs> I took Spanish. I think when Easy we were Easy A, baby. Yeah, when we were kids, I think the majority of schools only offered Spanish. Yeah. Mm. Uh, like maybe they had French or something like yeah. that. If you had a, if you had a more, um, more well-off school, but yeah. Spanish was definitely like the de, de facto language. Yeah. Uh, now I'm I'm sure you have a lot more yeah. options. In, I mean, my school I think had French, stuff, Spanish, but... Latin, maybe, and I'm, maybe one other. But Mine I don't had know Spanish if... and Latin. Yeah. yeah, I forgot mm. Latin. Yeah, everyone forgets Latin, right? <laughs> yeah, no, we did not have that in Edmonton. Uh, they what did they, I think before we became like our school changed hands so many times, and before it was like German and French, and I did German, and I like languages actually came pretty easy to me um mm. i was pretty good at german my uncle lived in switzerland so he okay. would like call me up and i'd like talk to him in german and stuff and like we'd do lessons frequently um don't know why i stopped that though because i was pretty sick at it uh <laughs> then uh switched over to spanish again was really really good at that um and my brother's girlfriend she was spanish she's still she's still spanish um <laughs> We She's not, this is, we're getting into Shenmue territory. <laughs> <laughs> Have you ever been Chinese? <laughs> Have you ever been Spanish? Um, and yeah, she used to come over and we would speak Spanish all the time. We went on holiday to, Sp uh, to Spain. Spain land. Yeah. Spain land mm -hmm. twice. <laughs> and I actually, I was like our guide, you know, I there kept us go. going. Yeah, wow. yeah. It's pretty proud. But this day right now, I have not spoken a word <laughs> of Spanish since. Yeah. It's probably still in there yeah. somewhere. Like I just have to like retrain the skill. But mm. um, closer to home, like obviously born in London, but my mum like spoke tree to me, which okay. is like the one of the main languages spoken in Ghana. Mm. And so that was like the dominant force when mm. I was growing up. And then you get to secondary school, everyone was like, your accent's really weird. So I kind of just like stopped. Mm. I was like, I'm not speaking this anymore. And mm -hmm. Like, it's one of those things where, like, if I'm in Ghana, if I'm around, like, family and stuff, it will come back slowly. But, um, mm. yeah, I have sort of lost it, which is a bit sad. And I know it's the case for a lot of, um, like, diasporans, mm -hmm. in particular, like, Ghanaian and Nigerian kids who were born here, taught, like, whatever language as a kid, lose it somewhere along the way but i like i can understand it like fluently mm, mm. like someone could be bitching about me and i'm like i know exactly what you're saying <laughs> i can maybe respond in i will you know, reply in two weeks when i've translated <laughs> my insult thinking about it in the shower just like <laughs> if I could just... ah that's the word for bell end <laughs> damn it <laughs> um uh, yeah so that's me well, it, it is interesting i will say and to anyone watching i mean language is near and dear to my heart i've kind of poorly on and off studied languages all my life and I, I'm, I'm like a wannabe polyglot, but not really. But I will say that thing of when people are like, oh, and like this language, like I definitely think there's the thing of like not psyching yourself out and just being like, there's no time like the present. You know, like just you can always start picking it up, you know, start watching things, start having little flashcard things on the side. I have recommendations for apps and sites and things you can use for people at the end of this show. So you have to stick around. But um, that and I also want to get into this later that i love the idea of like taking something like tree and trying to translate things into them even though whether there's a market or not as sort of like a performance piece because we, we talked previously on um one of the shows about kalb which is the arabic programming language that was made as like kind of as a point more than an actual functional language but it was just sort of like have we thought about how like everything is in english by default 
at mm-hmm. in programming what would it look like if it was something different like i'm still over here being like y'all let's do let's do retranslations of snes jrpgs into other languages please let's get a tweet pro- <laughs> let's get an arabic <laughs> translation of chrono trigger it doesn't matter that mo- not many people are going to play it let's just do it for posterity <laughs> but um speaking of jrpgs i have a theory that is only probably half provable but i have a theory and i'd like to get into the history a little bit of how we're at this present moment how we are at this present moment because um we're kind of spoiled for choice a little bit nowadays uh, especially being if you're in europe or not in in america essentially a lot of editions of games that we get um arrive with multiple translations on them um most games modern games that i buy for the switch or playstation or whatever uh have at least like four or five european languages and then often japanese uh korean and sometimes mandarin um so it it seems like nowadays it's almost taken as a matter of course but that wasn't always the case and i wanted to walk down memory lane to what (laughs) i'd like to call the wolsey era so any of you do you do you you remember this do you know what i'm talking about alex um i mean i it's it's a it's something that i haven't like researched okay uh so you're it's, not no so you're not you're not you're not part of the inner circle that's fine i will induct <laughs> you into the inner circle so the wolsey era for anyone who knows who's who's been through the jrpg gauntlet um because because this is the thing back in the day what, the games that have a lot of text are going to be rpgs everything else is like yeah if, if you want to play a platformer even if you're going to pirate it and you're you don't know any japanese but you're just like oh what's this random game you can download it there might be a few menus and maybe some story beats but mostly you can play the game the games that are going to be a struggle that really the quality of the experience is just not the same is something where the story is heavy and there's lots of text. So for the early community, uh, when, you know, we're thinking back to the era of like, you know, it's the famous Final Fantasy thing. We're just like, oops, we didn't bring over like four of them in a row. So you just we're just going to skip them. There was a whole generation of people in the West, English speakers, who didn't get to experience these games and realizing that you could pirate them and that there was these ROMs online there was an early interest and I wanted to, I wanted to shout out some of these amazing ROM hacking groups. we got multiple Demi Force. These names are so cool. Uh, <laughs> RPGE, Translation Corporation, Aeon Genesis, DJAP, slightly questionable name. Um, <laughs> so so th- this was an era where the, so the reason I call it the Wolsey era is because the main way games were often translated was just throwing a person into a room and being like, you have to translate this entire script. And Ted Woolsey was the famous, like he was like the go-to Square Enix translator. I don't have on hand the games that he translated, but I was like almost every major game from that era, either him or someone like that had touched it. And I think what's interesting is that you get, so there's these famous lines, uh, you get things like, you Spoonie Bard. I don't know if you remember yeah. that. That was that was a translation from Final Fantasy IV of like, some sort of insult that they're like, oh, we don't want to, we don't want to curse in a children's game. Uh, <laughs> you Spoony Bard, son of a submariner. Uh, the Final Fantasy VII one later on, the famous example of like typos was this guy are sick, which is like, if that's not in the retranslation of the game, that's, that's actually, that's doing violence to Final Fantasy VII's legacy. <laughs> <laughs> this guy are sick. <sighs> but, um, but no, so, so there's something about this era that, it, there was a lot of personality to these things because they're essentially like the fever dream translation of one person in a room over a period of time translating this entire thing and really worrying about things like frame like text frame constraints and you know they don't have the same memory uh you know there's memory limitations and i mean cg yeah. you can't forget about the thing that practically gave birth to internet memes to begin with the all your base are belong yeah to of us. course you're right all your base are belong to us for great justice and for every zig yeah that's true <laughs> so so there is this there's this tendency i mean it was almost like you're saying it's a quirk of this era of like oh the cra- the the english as they call it like all oh, the weird japanese translations but I think there's this kind of middle moment where these ROMs are becoming available, people are getting interested in the games, and then people are getting more and more interested in Japanese, like a younger generation, through anime and through games, and they're realizing as they compare the scripts, they're like, wait a second, he doesn't say son of a submariner, like what the hell is this? And you suddenly get this huge kind of like cultural movement backlash thing where people are like, we're going to retranslate these games. And not only retranslate, translate games we've never even gotten before. So I actually remember 
I, I don't know if, if again either of you have, uh, did this but i remember the final fantasy 5 translation being this like holy grail because you couldn't get there was no way to play final fantasy 5 and so you had to play the rom hack translation and that was just like i remember the debates about the main character's name butts barts butts it would be like oh that's the final fantasy it's all about butts isn't it but it was it was great it was such a it, it felt like you were discovering this secret world that you weren't allowed to access otherwise is that did, did anyone else have this journey is this like no it wasn't something that i had but it was something i experienced through osmosis through a friend of mine who okay. was talk like would talk incessantly about like the really bad final mm. fantasy 7 translation yeah. and <laughs> like despite all of that still like falling in love with the game and mm. actually like and maybe we will, we will get into this but those kind of like really bad translations having a ton of personality to them yeah exactly um that i think is actually a pretty good thing Yes, there's a, think, there, there's a secret. We're burying the secret here, but I, I, we're going to come back to this about what, how I feel, what we've lost from this era of translation. But yeah, go ahead, Alex. Well, I think it's, I just, my, the period in which I played, uh, the, probably the majority of the JRPGs I played was in a time that it was easy enough to get the right translations. Mm -hmm. uh, like I, did, I didn't have a Super Nintendo growing up. So You didn't have a, a Super of... Nintendo growing up? No, my friend did. I had to go to I their house. I don't know how I feel about this. Slumber part. I had a. I had. We talked about this. I had Sega's I must and have blocked it and, out of my uh, mind. And Sony's growing up. Wow. Um, yeah. Come on. All right. Well, I just <laughs> see you differently. So now. there was wasn't That's a funny. lot of JRPGs that I played then, and I think I'm gonna think actually that even if I had, even if I had and played a lot of them then. I probably would have been young and stupid enough to just like think that was the intent, right? Because you're just being served this thing that is supposed to be gospel because it's a yeah. it's a story that you're experiencing. And yeah. it's like, you probably just don't understand what that is. You can't read. <laughs> you, you can't, can't read. read. <laughs> <laughs> so, you, so, you didn't, so you played them later on? Yeah, yeah. a lot of the stuff I, would, I played yeah. later on in life when it was easier to get uh, or just more accessible to get the right quote-unquote translation. Yeah. Well, um, I, I just wanted to highlight some of the milestones we had. Um, so so some of the early games that were being translated, games like Magic Knight Ray Earth based on the anime, Dragon Ball Z games that never made it to the West, Ease games that never made it to the West, Dragon Quest games, BS Zelda, which is actually the name, uh, based on, I think those are the Satella View games. But some of the milestones we had, so Final Fantasy V in 1997, I think was the first major translation, Final Fantasy II in 1998. Uh, there's a bunch of other ones, Star Ocean, Seiken Desetsu 3, Mother 3, Mother three folks, which is still that is I mean that is the holy grail right now. Like it, it's stupid at this point that it hasn't been. But the the main way to play it, if you are an English speaker, or, or honestly, th th this is also what I want to get into is that because of just also world history and like imperialism and stuff, even non English speakers, but English as a second language, like it, English is the main way to access Japanese language games. So it becomes the kind of like funneling point. So like I've seen streamers in like Spanish, you know, I know they, they've worked on these kinds of translations as well for games like Mother 3, but the, the main way of accessing these Japanese games is through their second language, through English. So it's, it's, it's very, I'm just so sad for Mother 3, man. It's, a, it's such a good game. And the <laughs> fact that it's still, I don't know what Nintendo's doing, but we'll get to that in a second. No, but so what, what I really wanted to get at was this era, you had so much activity, so much, uh, effort around this and i thought what was interesting is that i haven't seen any kind of like direct quotes from people in the industry but it struck me like for a long time translation was kind of a no man's land you know it was it was something that if you had enough money to invest a lot in you could get a pretty decent translation and if you didn't it would just be very slapdash but besides like gameplay concerns you know like people say that square thought that uh Final Fantasy V was too hard for Western players. There was also, you know, investing in a script takes a very long time. And if you can skip it, then you you save a lot of money. And I, I think that a lot of the activity of this era, at least from what I can tell, tell me if I'm wrong, but it seems to me like a lot of the activity from this era kind of helped to fuel a, a whole sense of appreciation for Japanese games that I, th I think it did bleed into the industry as a whole. Like, I, I would love to find a smoking gun. I don't I don't have one. But it seems to me like the people from that generation who spent all that time translating those games ended up becoming the super fans who are like today still petitioning, you know, 
now now we have games like ease and we have games like the persona series and all the dragon quests and like all these games have since come over and i think part of that is because for better or for worse these companies could see there's a proven community behind them and i don't know i think that's kind of cute that <laughs> i think that's wonderful cute. I think I think there is something about um first of all the power of like weebiness. I think I was that just is about a to big say. that <laughs> is a big driving force behind it. Um yeah. like yeah, just massively. But also maybe there's something in like, I don't know, a forbidden fruit thing where it's like, mm -hmm. Oh, I can't have this thing. Yeah. But I want it and I'm gonna, you know, go to the ends of the earth to make it happen, you know? Yeah, and I guess you could even point to like your thing. I think you're right, when you say the power of weebiness, like look at fan sub communities for anime. Like and and that I think it's yeah. it's incontestable that fan communities affected what we have available to us now because for a long time it was just the principal way you could con consume any anime that wasn't like Cowboy Bebop or shit that was like already translated and dubbed or whatever is is through fan communities just creating these sites and you know Crunchyroll all that crap like there's no um, way that that would exist unless people had done that. I'm about to. <laughs> embarrass myself do it massively um so i mean this is like obviously it's related to the anime chat but like um it was very hard to get subtitles mm -hmm. back in the day right um the raw video would come out it would leak onto the internet and mm. i'm like there's no subs <laughs> there was the uh, day one subs what yeah what were those what were those things called they're not are they ircs or what are you talking about like irc channels yes like chat so there's one oh yeah yes. and you would go and like you'd ping a bot and it would like send you the yeah so <laughs> there was one called data bio it was uh <laughs> it was like this massive community that did subtitles for the nice. shonen jump animes oh, and nice. i was all up in <laughs> through there <laughs> and then i would like distribute it out to my friends uh, that's so good it's very embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> Earlier on, you were talking about, especially people who are ESOL, English as a second language. Um, what would be really interesting is people who, you know, had a very, very small grasp of English, mm -hmm. then taking those subtitles, which were barely related yeah. to the source material in the first place, but then translate into Spanish to then, yeah. you know, kind of pass it along to other people. And that That's know, a real just, exquisite corpse yeah. of like translation, you know, <laughs> like just whisper down the alley to the point where there's yeah. actually Tomato, who is one of the people we're going to be talking about today, who's one of the big translators, did Mother 3, Starman.net, all this stuff, uh, has a book on Legends of Localization that is called this game it's something like this game are translated badly or something and it's and it's not only examples of that but they also did um a, like machine it was like a multiple layer retranslation by google translate of i think final fantasy 4 so you get these like really weird i got to find there, there's these sentences that are like <laughs> my enema is inside the basketball and it's it's like something <laughs> that is you know the original statement was like please come to the castle or something <laughs> So I did want to clarify, uh, the book I was thinking of was actually two books. There's one called This Be Book Bad Translation Video Games, and that one is specifically about messed up translations in games. And then the other one is Press Start to Translate, which is specifically the, the machine translation, I believe, of Final Fantasy IV. And they're both really cool, glossy books that cost a boatload to import to the UK. So <laughs> if you're not in the UK, I highly encourage you to get... I have some of the Earthbound stuffs from, from Fangamer and legends of localization if you have any questions or curiosity about this stuff check out legends of localization we'll put the links in the description amazing site i think mostly run but amongst others by tomato uh i think it's clyde mandel who is is this translator um just really great comparison screenshots uh, long form analysis of differences in games and stuff like that but speaking of that i did want to my, my little soapbox amongst many for this for this episode one of, one of the things i wanted to say is I think what was so great about this era of people translating things on their own is that you get a kind of, um, you know, th there's a kind of openness and a creativity that 
you're not going to get from a professional team. But there's also a kind of like, there's an ideology that comes with it. And the ideology is like, we need to, we need to truly represent this. We need to represent this exactly as it is in the Japanese. And I know you know my, my man Pro ZD. You know, I know you've seen this video, the one where he's making fun of anime subs, you know, that it's like there is a tendency. That was a thing in the anime sub community as well for a long time of like you have to literally translate everything. And it almost you, you get to a point where you have these it's almost two extremes. You have literal translations that are extremely verbose and feel very, very like lacking of any personality. And then you also have moments where it seems like the the, the, the translators kind of like got bored and they fall into the exact same thing. The, the problem that they're critiquing, that's why they're making these translations in the first place. So one of the um, famous examples that actually is on Legends of Localization is the <laughs> Tales of Fantasia translation, where uh, they decided to translate this scene between characters where I think they were hinting that one of the characters is kind of like sexual or like might sleep with someone. And the way that they chose to translate it was, Mint has that quiet elegance about her, but I bet Arch fucks like a tiger. <laughs> <laughs> and this is like this is one of those things where they're like what we need to do is we need to communicate like this you know the, the games are always being censored so we need to communicate like the fullness of it and really show that this is about like sex but then then you go to the original translation you're like i don't think it was saying fucks like a tiger specifically <laughs> <laughs> but um well, basically my thing and i don't i don't have to i can summarize it in this is I'm super grateful to this era of like fans translating games and I don't think we'd be at the point we are at without them. I do think there's this thing, especially when you're first learning a language. So you can think like these, this younger generation of people getting pretty good at Japanese, but there's like a, there's like a minor fascism in it because you start to realize the differences and then you you start to police everyone's understanding and use of that language. And you're like, Oh, this is wrong. This is right. This is right. And the thing is, I mean, the, the spoilers, folks, like translation is just, it's a very creative act, you know? And I think the thing that we lost from the Wolsey era, like people made fun of Ted Wolsey for all these creative liberties he took. But you go and you play those translations, play Chrono Trigger, play Final Fantasy VI, play the games from this era. They are a blast. Like there's, and it's not, it's not because they're making things up there. It's very hard to communicate the sense of some of the original Japanese sometimes. And mm -hmm when you're making a translation, sometimes you're making a point of prioritizing that character's like lore and who they are over the specific thing being said in the moment. There's, there's so many different concerns. And yeah, I just think it's, it's an important era, but I think it's really funny looking back and seeing how you get these, like go and play some of the early retranslations. Like there's a retranslation project for FF6. I'm sorry, folks. Like I will, ne I will always play the Ted Wolsey version because it just, it's like people being like, the empire is bad. Yes, it is. Let us go defeat the empire. I'm like, I don't want to do that, man. I want to, I want, I want to hear Edgar flirting with people. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I think what's interesting about this is that, you know, it's easy to say that almost because about those older, older games, because there's a bit of, um, there's a bit of cheesiness about it about mm -hmm. the even the storylines and the delivery about it so like you almost you're almost like yeah give me more of that that accepted camp um but then with like now with a lot of the stories that games are, are wanting to tell and how they get translated that creative liberties of the translator it it puts me in a it puts me in a strange place because I, I think about i think about how i feel when i'm reading like obviously when I'm reading like a translation of Proust or Tolstoy or something like that, I can never help, I can never get over the fact that like, I probably will never be able to experience the original thing of this. Mm. Like I will never be able to experience the, the actual intended feeling or the intended mm. uh, communication of, of these words. And what am I actually, what am I actually experiencing here? Right? Like I'm, I'm experiencing somebody else's interpretation of this and I'm, I'm always experiencing this thing vicariously. Um, and that, that's going to be the same for video games, right? Like, yeah. I, and where now, you know, writers on narrative video games are, are, you know, held up very, very highly close to the director or uh, creative director of the video game entirely. And it's, and if I'm experiencing it through a translation, it just is that like, you know, one more degree of yeah. Kevin Bacon or whatever mm, that I'm, yeah. I just, it's just I don't I don't know if I have a point here. It just feels like it's a weird feeling. Like yeah, how it's, it's how FOMO. You're experiencing language FOMO. <laughs> is what <laughs> yeah, that in is. A way. In a way, but it's like and maybe this comes down to like the translators and this is not a, not trying to me like call out or be a or you know 
not appreciate the work that translators do. It just feels like it's impossible when you want to appreciate the writing beyond just the the actual the plot or the story itself. You want to experience the writing that the, the lines and the and yeah. the setting and everything that is communicated. But you're always unless you can you are native in a lot of I don't know, a native speaker of a lot of these things you'll never really be able yeah. to experience its full glory i guess mm. as it were i guess the flip side to this that i've just now kind of started thinking about is i wonder though with you know people who are like naysayers of the old school era translations is there like an element of like fetishism going on there yeah. where it's like you know you need to hold it to the highest standard and you yeah. know you know give it all the honor that it deserves and yeah. i wonder yeah i wonder if there's some of that i actually think not from as, you alex but as you're <laughs> saying it though i actually was thinking about this as y'all were talking is that i wonder as well in that same vein if the impulse like the impetus for that retranslation movement was partially because of you know my, my argument always video forthcoming is that i love final fantasies but the, the final fantasy stories have never been good like, or, or they're not good stories. Like you just mentioned Proust and Tolstoy. Like, sorry, <laughs> folks. It's it's not just elitism to put put something like a really complex novel side by side with a Final Fantasy game. And it's it's like peanuts. And I love games, but it's just they do something different. And I think, yeah. I think what you actually, Shay, you're hitting on something that it, it, it occurred to me that I wonder if part of what the retranslation movement was, was like fans trying to translate the sense of gravitas that they experienced playing these games into the game's translation of like, no, this is a massive story. This is an important story and it's being like diminished by this thing. It needs to be given the seriousness that it has. But then you get the ironic thing of like Final Fantasy VI is a campy game. Like you've got like a guy wearing a ski mask, like attacking dragons with chainsaws and stuff. Like it's, you know, it, there, it has serious, I think it has weight to it, emotional weight, mm. but there's yeah. a way in which you know that the, the prosy d joke was always like what is it like you are my nakama you fucking bitch and it's like <laughs> whoa that is is that really how they like the original naruto dialogue is or is that just a misguided attempt to try and like give these things this feeling of like serious artistic weight um and i do think i think you're right alex in the sense that it is that is literally the struggle i'm not gonna go deep into it but i love me some walter benjamin and and his thing he has an essay the task of the translator and his whole thing is like that is, this is what translation is. And in fact, in so many words, this isn't exactly what he says, but that there's, there's a way in which reading that you could think like the translator's name should kind of be side by side with the author's name yeah. because mm -hmm. you're kind of, that is what you're reading. And I think that is just sort of the impossibility. Like I love reading these like Russian authors and whatever, but I mean, no, I think Nabokov was the one who said he's like, my, my English is like, my, my Russian is like a palace and my English is like a little small, like country house. And this mm -hmm. is a man who wrote like insanely well in English. So you're like, what is his Russian like? Holy crap. <laughs> so I, I do, I do feel that. And I, and I'll end by saying when I have been able to access the language, like, so if it's a game in, in Spanish or even just a translation in Spanish, 100% in the reverse, the, there's personality missing. Like yeah. I, I played bug fables almost entirely in Spanish. And that was partially an exercise in frustration. There's, a, I think it was actually the, the, the studio was Panamanian, but I don't know what they did with that version of the game because there's tons of typos. And there's something about the, at least the English translation, or if they did it side by side with the original game, that is very, like, it's full of personality and flair. And the, the Spanish one is really kind of all over the place. And I think Persona 5, that was Spanish fans called that one out as well for having kind of a similar problem of that a lot of what people talk about is the personality of Persona 5 feeling like it wasn't there in the Spanish translation. Mm. And I think that speaks to what you said, Alex, that the, the way it's planned out, the way video game teams work translation is kind of an afterthought it's not really yeah. like built into you know I, what if this kind of plays into a little bit um because we're touching on these bits and bobs is how i feel like sometimes it's more difficult for me and i know this isn't the case for everybody but it's more difficult for me to invest myself into characters in rpgs when they're fully voiced interesting because in the um in like the early era of 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 RPGs and JRPGs and stuff, I I almost feel like the the text that you're given um, is almost like line reads, right? Like they're they're prompters for mm. you to start fleshing out the story and fleshing out the dialogue, how you would imagine these characters to do it, mm -hmm. and it brings you into, it almost brings you into the writer's room in a way where like 
because they were very simple, both the stories and the mm-hmm. dialogues, because they're just trying to like communicate in 16 bit or whatever, like uh, yeah. uh, a story of with screens flashing up. But it, I rem- I can remember like my my imagination sort of. I mean, even when I play these games now, sort of going wild and filling in so many gaps and details that when there's no voice acting, like my, yeah, my mind is just free to like, to do all of that mm-hmm. and kind of r- write the story how I would see it fit with this basis of the dialogue or this basis of the story that's being put in front of me. But when things are shown so explicitly through mm-hmm. voice acting, mm-hmm. um, like that's the end and all and be all, right? Like that's it. So when there's... When things feel lacking there, there's nothing that your mind can really do to flesh it out because you're being given this mm. this definitive version of it. So what you're saying is, when there's voice acting, you need to you need to put it in a language you don't understand. So that way, <laughs> right. you keep yeah. it in the original Japanese, not for authenticity, but just so that your mind can still have room to kind of play. Yeah, no, and I do <laughs> think that I do think that that is uh, that's true for a lot of mediums and not just video games. I mean, yeah. I do try and play. Um, I do try and play you know if it's if there's a japanese setting video game or a japanese video game I'll I'll play it in the video in the japanese audio yeah. uh just because that Same. makes sense to me Same. um but where i what i might miss from um you know from a poor translation of the subtitles i still my mind maybe because it's been trained to do so from playing earlier video games yeah. like my mind is still trained to sort of fill in the gaps of yeah. of story and personality and how these characters are and um I'm. I don't know if that's like a, a known phenomenon of the brain or whatever. When <laughs> when when doing when reading something. No, I like it. Stuff, hey, I'm but... I'm really into like on the fly hypotheses. So <laughs> to me, that sounds like a great one. It fits in with the whole way I look at RPGs anyway, because that because that's how I think of RPG settings and RPG stories. Like they're all about giving you a sense of a world rather than explaining it bit by bit. Yeah. And when they when they try to explain it too much, you know, you kind of lose some of that. But uh, speaking of voice acting, is there any? Um, I'm thinking of even recent games. Is, are, have there been any voice acting uh, deliveries or like you know uh, dubs of games that you've actually thought w- were really good and wanted to do in the English? Because this happened to me. I'm actually playing Bravely Default 2 in the English right now, mm, rather wow. than Japanese. There was a game um, that I played that's a very Japanese game, mm-hmm. uh, but I s- is explicitly played it in English because I. Because just of what I heard, that it was worth it. Um, Nino Kuni, fucking oh. Japanese name. <laughs> Nino Kuni, Wrath of the White Witch. Um, I played it because in English, um, even though this is like the animeist of anime games, mm-hmm. uh, I was told that I read before that one of the main characters is um, is basically rewritten for the English trans. English voice acting and translation and all of that rewritten as a, as a like curmudgeon Scottish character, mm-hmm. um, where I think he, it's, it's Mr. Drippy, which is a wild name. Okay. Um, and, uh, uh, in the Japanese version, I think, I'm sure he's still a little bit like curmudgeon and stuff like yeah. that, but he's, he's given a very, like a very, um, in a way I think caring but humorous treatment for the for the English localization and he's one of the best characters in the game for sure and it's it's it is hilarious and it is uh it is that thing of like a new personality sort of the Wolseley thing Mm -hmm. uh or Wolsey thing um Mm -hmm. a new personality that didn't exist in the other one but like still purposefully given like I don't know what the decision was in from the Japanese studio on this or if this was just a um a you know distributor decision or or what but it was a good one and i have played it in japanese again um and while it's still very good in japanese it i think it it is an example of a of a at least because of this very specific reason yeah. of a better experience in in english That's interesting this wasn't going to be my point, but this made me think of like in a lot of anime, um, there's a certain Japanese dialect. I don't know it off the top of my head. I'm really sorry. Um, but whenever it's translated into English, they're always like a Southern, like, I don't know why I'm I wonder if that's Kansai, but, <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, just made me think of that. I'm that, thinking what, what, of like loads of characters now that have that. Um, that's a good point too, because I've, uh, even in Bravely Default, I'm, I'm actually curious about the original Japanese. There's a, a bunch of the characters are it's all like uk kind of like uh xenoblade 
chronicles where they're all uk different island accents so whether it's ireland or it's sorry british isles plus uk that whole kind of like region um ireland or welsh or scottish scottish I'm, I'm just struggling <laughs> here folks there's too much language on my plate right now scottish and there's a character in the english so i'm playing with the english dub and spanish translation in the text and in the english dub the character elvis is scottish sounding in the spanish translation they've made him kind of like argentinian which is interesting because then it's like it speaks to how do you like how many points of remove is this so like is it kansai accent originally turned to scottish turned to argentinian <laughs> but the point is that you have to somehow indicate an otherness i guess from the, the the hegemonic language and this is how they're indicating it so like i i remember chrono cross actually one of the spanish youtubers i follow uh i don't know what year but it was a few years back there, there was a chrono cross spanish translation project and one of the beautiful things about it that they did was they they had a huge team of translators from all over the spanish-speaking world and so because chrono cross has it's like an anarchic game you know people people make fun of it but like there's just so many freaking characters in that game and the the joy of that Spanish translation is they just went hog wild. Like there is every kind of like there's Colombian accents, there are Venezuelan accents, there's like <laughs> you know D Dominican Republic, there's Spain, Spain, there's Northern Spain, Southern Spain. There's just so many different accents in there, and that to me speaks like there's a kind of love and care in that that is really nice to see. That that feels like a modern translation project. That that's actually a fan project rather than the companies, but that feels very modern in that it's less concerned with the kind of overall like hegemonic voice and and it's really trying because i guess chrono cross is a good example too there's, there's characters that speak in all caps you know like that, <laughs> that uh, they have like very specifically different voices and stuff um so yeah i, I love to see that kind of thing I, I wonder if is it an accident of i have heard on the street i don't know if this is true that when you have a lot of british cast as well that it's cheaper i don't know if that's true so i'm like is this is this really an artistic decision on the side of the studio or are they like hmm british that's isles funny. cast is going to be slightly cheaper than the north american cast let's just mm -hmm. go for that well i guess but, there's a lot of games that are set in a sort of like pseudo medieval time period oh, which yeah. i think most people um sort of globally associate with like the isles or at least yeah, exactly. or at least european Father. Um, and then if it's in english <laughs> then if it's english european obviously it's sort of the isles yeah yeah, we, uh, we need to break that. From. Yeah, we need to, we need to have fantasy that. that is not freaking weird mid-Atlantic accent, you know, mer merging into the, the perceived pronunciation or something. I, I need to hear something different for once. Something else. Actually, uh, what you said about the kind of um, the tendency to sway towards like, hege oh, I can never say this. Hegemonic. This word beats my ass. That yeah. word. Um, <laughs> accent. It kind of speaks to the issue with like, um, kind of representation politics within games and actually mm. just in media in general is that we end up going for this very right okay we need to represent black people yeah what's the what's the black experience and I'm like that changes depending mm. on where you look like yeah. you know and yeah I just just you know some flavor it's not that hard <laughs> you know there's well, so no, much material you're... to work with and I think you're, you're right in the sense that I would love to see more and we were talking about this off camera like I would love to see more uh, re retranslations, but not in that like angry verbose fan kind of angle, mm -hmm. but like as as interventions, you know. So like one thing that you know I've been studying Arabic for a while. People who are Arabic speaking primarily and want to play a game like Chrono Trigger, they're just going to play the English version, you know. Usually, I, I would love to do like let's let's retranslate Chrono Trigger into Arabic. I, I mean, even making the characters work on a SNES. Mm -hmm format is going to be awkward as hell mm. but it would be great to kind of just like mentally put that picture into people's minds so that it seems possible you know it would be, be great in that same sense to do retranslation projects of other things and, and introduce code switching introduce different kinds of ways of speaking mm. and, and i think you're right even that in narrative design that writers aren't even thinking about it you know because it's hard it, it does take effort and, and time but like i suppose we're in, a, in an era now where you want to be like please may take yeah. the time like why yeah, just, why not do it like what yeah. you're not thinking and, and i'm going to use this time for my next soapbox <laughs> when they're designing these games i i truly think it's like a sci-fi show you know i always get annoyed at star trek and the universal translator because they're just they just like oh yeah language is solved we don't have to think about it and then they say stupid shit like well there's an old earth phrase you know uh 
you know, monkey see, monkey do. And I'm like, no, that's an English phrase. That's not an earth <laughs> phrase. Unless you're trying to make a point about the hegemony of English. No, they're not doing that. They're just not thinking about it. And uh, in games too, it's like translation is such a secondary thing that you end up with this thing of like totally different feeling games in different languages. And then also, even in terms of accessibility, like I can't tell you how many games that I've played where if I want to play it in Spanish, I have to have my system settings in Spanish. Thankfully, I do, right? But I'm just saying, like, if I had it in English and I put into the game, I'm like, where is the, where is the Spanish setting? Like, how do I play this in Spanish? I've heard you can play this game in Spanish. It's like they, they want to, they are just assuming, why would you want to play it in any other language? And I'm like, why, why take that choice away from players? Just let them, the, the whole point of being exposing yourself to other cultures and languages is to do it as an act of, like, experiencing the other. So let us fucking do it. Just let me choose. What if I want to play it in a language I don't even understand? And just, just to expose myself to it, just to see how it's done. Like, I... There's, I, I just feel too much language is considered this kind of weird afterthought that's mostly like you, you do it quickly, you contract it out to another company like Xseed, which has done some good translations, and then you kind of forget about it. But it would be great to have those people in the room and, and make it like from the beginning. Don't just let me have it in the menu. Let me live translate. Let me let me do like Secret of Monkey Island HD edition. I want to live switch between translations. How cool! Would that, I did, I just think that would be awesome. Yeah, you know, like, like you the could compare the settings that you can have and the options of going between the old, the original graphics or the updated graphics. Yeah, yeah. Just do it with languages. I mean, it would it would there be there would be some concerns because obviously character lengths and maybe a dialogue window goes longer or shorter. So it's not like it's just you snap your fingers and it's done. But I just think it, I want to see the first game that does it that is designed for people because there's you know not everyone is monolingual but there are people who are bilingual you know or you want to teach someone like i grew up like speaking spanish but video games were part of my way of getting into english because i could i would love to have been able to redo those things side by side so this is come on somebody work on this with us please <laughs> let's get this let's get somebody. this in a game or you know if, if somebody out there is watching and knows a game that actually does do this let us know yeah that'd be cool I yeah think i would love to know it's a particular kick in the teeth because, you know, games talk about like, you know, we want this to be a global phenomenon. We want yeah. everyone playing games by X year. And I'm just like, there's an entire market, like the entire global south is just not considered when yeah. it comes to video games. And it's like, you could do that by baking this thing, these things in from the beginning, you know? Yeah. And like, even as we're kind of talking about it now, I was like, oh, you know, like, if I was going to sit down and like introduce my grandma to games, I mean, she speaks English. She lived in the UK for like 32 yeah. years, but I was like, oh yeah, it's fine. Cause we could just play it in English. But I'm like, that's the problem is that that kind of colonial mentality is still like yeah. kind of present in everything, which uh, sucks. <laughs> which okay. sucks people. You heard it here mm. first. Colonialism. Colonialism. Sucks. <laughs> <laughs> I will. But no, I think, yeah. I think that those then should also allow us to like sort of applaud the people who make the effort to do the good thing. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, whatever you want to say about Ghost of Tsushima and the and the yeah. anything about it, like them getting very involved with a Japanese cast and getting an original uh, Japanese written dialogue and and uh, and voice acting. Yes, they weren't able to do the the, um, the, lips, the motion yeah. capture yeah, yeah. for it, which I think uh, you mentioned that they were they did they do with and, Yakuza. Yeah. But like actually representing the setting that you've used very heavily in the story that you want to tell uh despite not being from there um or having any sort of you know connection yeah. beyond like beyond an admiration for it i guess yeah. um and doing it right that way i think is is both important for the experience and and uh and the story that you're telling yeah. because there are so many games so many games that have that have come along anything from you know like the villains are typically russian speaking english to each other but with an mm -hmm. with a russian accent is yeah. ridiculous to uh like i think my the most annoyed example and specifically just because of my own uh you know life experience but sleeping dogs which is about uh it was basically if you're not familiar with it uh it's a gta set in hong kong basically okay. uh it was a rebranded um uh, true crime hong kong game okay. like after true crime la um and uh they did this they just did this thing where they took these characters, which are all Hong Kongese, and they're all speaking English to each other, except for when they want to uh, to cuss. And right. it just gets this very like crass thing of like, this is the only representation of this ga game, uh, sorry, of this language in this game that you're very much uh, 
taking a a western yeah. viewpoint of and the the sort of the cultural bone that you're going to throw is the equivalent of like you learning how to say penis in italian yeah. <laughs> you know like and and just learning the bad words from your friend who speaks a yeah. who speaks a language and that's the language the, the 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 representation that you're that you're giving to to the setting and it just feels so well it's, it's it is just crass and it yeah. feels just disrespectful well, and uh, I think you're, you, we, we spoke about this a little bit, but I think there is an accessibility question. So obviously there's these questions of, okay, how do you telegraph certain things and you need the player to understand things. But mm -hmm. I also think that's not like, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. There's ways of doing that. And there's ways of even including a, more or a lot of dialogue in the original language or having it, you know, th this is the other thing. But here's the question is like, I remember, story time, I remember reading Orhan Pamuk, the, the Turkish writer. He has a... a a book about his experiences growing up in Istanbul and stuff. But when you read about like uh, pre, like in the Ottoman times, even for all the, you know, imperial activity that they had, Istanbul was this incredibly cosmopolitan place with this, like all these different languages being spoken and Greek and Armenian and different things. And so like, there's a way in which walking down the street in a particular part of Istanbul, as he's explaining it, is like, it's this inherently just like polyglot experience where there's just, you can't know every language and you might know a lot of them and you might have like, you know, you're, you might be conversational in some of them more than others, but like there's an, there's an inherent experience of like otherness, just walking down the street and having to accept that this is the, the, the cacophony around you. And that with the kind of the Kemalists and the rise of the Republic and all these things, there was this like very nationalist effort to be like, no, Turkish is the only language, speak Turkish, stop using the Arabic script, we're using a Latin script now and policing it. And that's not, you know, you can't fully erase those communities, they're obviously still going to be there. But there, there's a thing of like, okay, there's accessibility, but then there's also like, there's something to be said for that experience of being othered, you know, that it's okay, like, especially if most of the game is going to be menus in English or whatever it is, like, why not let, let a player walk down the street and hear something that they don't understand? Mm. Yeah. Is, it, is that going to be the worst thing? And and maybe you can even incorporate that, you know, the more you think about it, you can incorporate it into the, the stuff, the actual plot of the game. There could be, if you've ever seen The Next Generation, there could be the Darmok and Jalad style episodes. That's that's the episode where the universal translator breaks down, of wh where it's like you, you have the characters start to question their own experience. And maybe there's a quest like Yakuza style where you... You're trying to understand someone and you can't understand them and you have to find another way to, to, to communicate with them. I mean, there's just so many possibilities. And I think Yakuza is a good example because that technology, we are. I think we're getting to the point where the technology is good enough where, yeah, they had the, as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, but they, had a, they have some kind of technology with the lip syncing where they recorded the dubs for both of them, but then the, the lips kind of correspond to just, it, it's not pre-rendered. It's sort of, yeah. re, it, it responds to whatever sound is coming out. So it's it's not perfected completely yet, but it is it feels like a step forward in maybe the way you've spoken, Alex, about like the Unreal Engine before. Of like when you make this accessible enough and easy enough to do, maybe in the future there won't be as harsh of a line between the translations because they'll just say, okay, well, you know, we, the lip syncing will always work, so we just need to make sure that the script works as well and that the dub is done properly. But yeah, I, I think there's something to be said for that. Let's get let's get more games where you're confused. I mean, <laughs> it's... <laughs>
uh, the GBA translation, a fan translation, and a Google Translate. And in this example we have here, it's Final Fantasy VI. And the cool thing that they have here as well is they've in integrated it with um, like Firefox extension type things. So there's there's an extension called Rikai-chan where you can hover over words and it will give you the translations of them on the fly. So that, that helps especially with like kanji and stuff that you can't read. But so Tomato ha had done this whole like live, they, 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 I think they played through like a lot of the game using this this software. But I thought it's such a great idea. It's very poorly supported. I think there, he did a bunch of a bunch of kind of scripts for major games like Super Mario RPG, FF4, FF6, and then he kind of just like left it. And people, I think people were trying to say, "Hey, like release the source code so we can like create forks and stuff." I don't know what the status of it is now, but it's such a great it's such a great tool. I think we're gonna do a stream of it sometime because I would love to do this. Um, but it's it to me. The response that that he got from this and the amount of interest almost it's almost like proves itself mm -hmm. that there is there is a, a a niche for this kind of thing and that while i don't expect game companies to like bend over backwards to to do this to every game i would love to see more games thinking about this and and at least you know maybe even if it's not the or original release maybe in re-releases especially if it's a major game like how many releases has final fantasy 7 had at this point Oh. You know, like international edition, <laughs> like further edition. You know, I would love to see many. a version that is is mindful of the fans because there's great channels. There's um, I was gonna shout out Game Gengo has has a channel right now that's doing uh, every single cutscene in the Final Fantasy VII remake and analyzing all of the Japanese in it. You had even you know Tim Rogers' own slow translation of FF7, Daniel Burke's retranslation of FF7. It's all I'm glad all that stuff exists. But I would love to see this kind of thing, the the Wander Bar thing, become part of of more games. Because as I'm even playing Bravely Default, I'm hearing the English and reading the Spanish script, and there's there's differences. And I'm like, oh crap! I would love to just be able to compare this stuff on the fly. You know? I mean, Shay, you were talking about how like language video games are garbage. <laughs> <laughs> like garbage. They are chocolate covered broccoli, is what they are. And do you mean by that? Do you mean like, well, like games this, of learning feels, language or yeah, 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 like yeah. I don't, I can't, don't remember the names of them, but I, I do remember being a kid and like having some something like the equivalent of Word Blaster Plus or whatever. <laughs> um, but like this kind of thing, this kind of tool where you actually can see, you can play the game, and this can be a learning tool. Yeah, a game a, like a, a playing a game like this because you can directly see. I mean, sure, it requires. A base amount of knowledge yeah mm -hmm. but this is the kind of this is the equivalent of uh you know people saying oh they just expose themselves through watching a lot of english television mm -hmm. and learning it that way like this is that but for other languages and it's a thing that you can learn languages through through experience of things that you like it doesn't yeah, have to exactly. be it doesn't have exactly. to be a constant grind on textbooks or whatever like yeah. it's, it's i wish it's, i had this back in college i remember i was playing ff6 exactly in Japanese when I was still actively studying it and having that on one and then having a browser and doing all this stuff and it was a pain to do. Yeah. I would have loved to have something like this. You know, maybe I wouldn't have been it's your fault, gaming industry. This is why I'm not <laughs> studying Japanese anymore. <laughs> no, but like maybe who knows if that tool would have been the thing to kind of like keep me yeah. on top of it in a way that I, I wasn't. In addition to my lack of discipline, I know that that's a factor. But um how great would this be? Can you imagine playing Yakuza? I mean Yakuza especially, that game, what did we say? It has like twenty hours of cutscenes? Or something. Yeah, at least. At, at least. least. <laughs> I mean, it, it, you know, in an active cutscene, it is kind of hard to see how it would unfold. But there's still subtitles. You, you could you could have yeah. hold a button, and it like brings up the, your translation of choice. Yeah, just I'm sure next the Japanese. It, I'm know. sure the Japanese voice acting still has Japanese subtitles that you can turn exactly. on, which would be the exact same that they're saying. So that I'm sure it would still work even with, with cutscenes. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So, what wish list? More bilingual, trilingual, etc. Games. More games that include other languages just as part of the aesthetic and story anyway, whether you, they're translated or not. And more tools, I guess. More more understanding, because I think that's the thing. People use these things for learning anyway. So why not lean into that and, and give people more streamlined access? Even script dumps. Man, I, I love script dumps, but like fans often have to make script dumps of games. you know. So you can find like the FF7 script. Somebody's made an, an Excel spreadsheet of the entire FF7 script with all the kanji and all that stuff. Again, I don't see a company losing anything. The story's out there, okay? It's not even the game. Just like, you know, help help fans dump the script out. Maybe more, you know, transparency around that process. 
I just want it. I just want it all. Please give it to us. Please give us everything, <laughs> and everything will be better. <laughs> everything at once it does sort of feel like they're leaving money on the floor like if if yeah. even if that's their sole motivation like it would bring yeah. so many people in it's just it would be an incredibly useful tool you know yeah do, I, do you I all think... have any uh just just rounding out a bit do you all have any holy grails any things that you know isn't available that you would love for it to be available there's still a lot of like the Japanese games, like there's still a lot that have not been translated into English, and especially older ones. Like there's there's still games from the early era that have never been fully translated. It's available now, but um, Fire Emblem because you just couldn't yeah, get it yeah. before, and yeah. like yeah, for to the point time. where I literally thought that they made those characters specifically for yeah. Smash. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I think there was a generation of us that thought that. Yeah. Like, who the fuck is Marth? Marth, Roy, <laughs> oh, shit original character. characters, like. <laughs> I, I mean i played through it last year but mother three is always gonna it's be just... there and like the, the fan tomato did you know like it's a th part of it is that you don't know what you don't know right you don't mm -hmm. know what you're missing yeah. from from what a uh what the translation could be and then for further there's a lot of games that just haven't been released that maybe i've heard the existence of but i don't really know anything about it because i didn't yeah. deep dive into it and it's just i don't know what i don't know yeah so i'm sure that's what's kind of the exciting thing if yeah. people are opening up to it i mean we got yakuza right like yeah that was um that was something that you mentioned before had only sort of been s scattered through in english until finally yakuza zero and which i think i'm, I'm sure it was a commercial decision because they saw that this is not an unmarketable thing in the mm. west uh and and then we can we have the barrier with this prequel now that that uh, the Western audience isn't going to feel like oh I, how can I play Yakuza six how can mm. I play Yakuza six I haven't played the other five Yakuza games or whatever so they broke they broke that barrier down with a prequel and then followed suit with all of the rest of the games in either remasters or yeah. or remakes with uh, with full translations uh, I, what's kind of interesting and just an anecdote about Yakuza is that. It's not called Yakuza in Japan, which yeah, because it's like it has, a dragon, isn't it? It's yeah, it's called like a dragon. It's, so it's like so, uh, what is that? What is the fir current one called in Japan? Then is it like, like a, dragon, a dragon? Like a dragon? Like a dragon? <laughs> no, it's uh, it's like like a dragon. Um, the gray, the gray areas, like uh, okay. the whereabouts of the gray zone or something like that. That's interesting. Um, I'm sure that I'm sure there's not a. I mean, that fits with the game story. For yeah, sure. yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Gray zone. But that's yeah, it's like like a dragon one through seven, and then I think that they all have <laughs> subtitles. But, yeah, um, Ryuga Gotoku or something. Mad. Oh, um, of course. Yeah. I feel like. So I, I was just gonna say too though that like uh, nowadays a lot a lot have been translated, but like for a long time the some of the I think some of what was it Star Ocean Star Ocean now has been released. There's like start there's in like multiple versions, first departure R and stuff like that. But that's a that and second and sets three weren't available in the West. Sagan Decessor 3 particularly wasn't available in the West until I think the Trials of Mana collection, which was just recently. So the only way that you could play it for a really long time was also through the through the fan translation. But, uh, you know, we also had like in the recent, wasn't the, the recent Direct, we had the Famicom Detective Club, stuff like mm -hmm. that, which like, it, it's funny, almost every genre that, ha I know there's, there's always gonna be cultural differences, but almost every genre that was thought that could not be successful outside of Japan has managed to find an audience so it's whether bigger or smaller it's just kind of funny of like no 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 well like you know western audiences they don't like they don't like hard rpgs like well that was proven wrong like well they don't like uh you know visual novel type games like well that's been proven wrong <laughs> like phoenix totally. Wrights, all those came over and that, power you know, the of the weebs is yeah exactly. the power of the weebs so is, is endless like it doesn't matter what it is here's one radical dreamers Hey, I know that's the one that y'all are thinking about. Radical Dreamers, am I right, folks? Oh, any, I don't know what you're talking about. Any, <laughs> no any Radical Dreamers in chat? Um, I'm looking I'm looking through a list now, and there's definitely some stuff. Um, like, I didn't realize that Sweet Home had never been yeah. uh, released. Again, you, with, can, you can play these, but these are all yeah, fan Yeah, of course, with fan translations yeah. and stuff, yeah, but yeah. no official ones. I mean, especially something just as... Especially with the amount of interest now in like going back and understanding you know the roots of video games with retro gaming and stuff like that yeah. that sweet home something that had inspired one of the biggest franchises in in video games with yeah. resident evil is not yeah. available 
Uh, Radical Dreamers, folks, is the game between Chrono Trigger and Chrono Cross. Chrono Cross. I literally just read that in the oh, headline. My okay. mind, wow, blown. Yeah. I mean, what? it's it's very weird. It's it's a visual novel, um, and it's very very strange. But it is it's got a really cool atmosphere to it. Um, and it feels like it's like one of those first person Shadowgate style dungeon crawlers. But with this particular, the thing that's very Japanese about it is like it has branching storylines, but the branching storylines are like they abide by this this like cosmological logic that has nothing to do with like how western stories are told because you're like oh cool like i get to experience the world in different ways and every time you play it it's it's like anime you're like wait it's the same world but everyone's gender is swapped you're like it's the same world but now there's an alien you're like what what does this have to do with chrono trigger but it, but it is still the main game and some of the endings mm. are quite cool um it's not it's not an amazing game but i would love to see that i don't think it's ever been uh, released in any kind of like Western collection, they they've neglected that series is the point. But yeah, so there, so we've got our holy grails. If y'all have any holy grails, uh, in the in the chat in the comments, as it were, please let us know. I think we're gonna do a stream soon. I I'm I'm big into this idea. I want to do live, like Alex has the um, you know the the Alex Pepley <laughs> hole, the deep late night trances. I think I think what I want to do is like. I want to do what I do, which is just try and study the, the game, the language while I'm playing the game and, and, and introduce other people to the concept. Cause I, th I don't think as many people are aware of these tools and that, that they exist. Um, and it would be great to have some of y'all with us. Well, for your brain power, the fact that you can do all those things at the same time, I'm like, I'm envious. The, the key thing, the key, remember Jack of all trades, master of none. The key thing about <laughs> doing all those things is not that you do them well. It's just being <laughs> just able to it. kind of feign <laughs> the ability to kind of juggle long enough for the king to turn his back and then you and then you drop albert him. einstein didn't have any friends Shane. yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying to have friends over here i'm trying to have a social life no no folks i really want to say like the language stuff people think it's beyond their grasp and people are always saying like oh and it's so hard and this, this. and it is it, it requires effort like anything else but you would be surprised especially when you get into it and it's something that you feel connection to you would be surprised how much it can that connection can keep you going and if you want help, you're going to have to tune in soon to our Twitch, which I will tell you about in a second. But first, I want to say thank you to my panelists, uh, Alex P. and Shay, for being here today and letting me kind of soapbox five or six times because <laughs> I just love to talk about languages. But um, yeah, thank you for joining me. And thank you all for watching. Um, if you like our content, please give us a like and a subscribe because that does actually help. Um, you can check out our Patreon as well if you want to support us more. Uh, we have Patreon exclusive content, uh, a lot of cool stuff in the pipeline, retro reflections, other things, uh, early access to videos, longer cuts of videos as well that you'll be able to see. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter at GHG Show and as well on Twitch at twitch.tv slash GHG Show. Keep an eye on multiple streams a week, fun times, cool vibes, duck racing. <laughs> and yeah i mean duck race let's be honest it's all about duck racing um Steady. yeah i think that's everything thank you so much for watching and we will see you again soon